Hello and welcome to the Linux Lads. This is episode 103. As usual, I'm Shane and I'm joined by Amelith, Connor and Mike. Say hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. And uh, today we are joined by a special guest. Uh, we're joined by Kieran, who you might recognize from our Telegram chat. <laughs> hello, Kieran. Hello. So um, in a nutshell, Kieran, who are you and why are you here? <laughs> I get asked that question a lot every time I enter a room. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm here. I'm here to talk to you today about uh, some projects I work on. Uh, but to sort of introduce myself. I'm a technical writer and former programmer, um, and I do work in the open source space for a project called Funkwell, which is a an audio publication and music cataloging system uh, powered by ActivityPub. As well as uh, I'm helping with the specking work for a project called the Open Podcast API, which is another attempt to create a podcast syncing service uh, for podcatchers. So a kind of uh, continuation of what Gpod has started. Okay, I'm sure we're going to have a ton of questions about this. Um, I suppose let's start with Funkwhale. Um, how did you get started with that? So it was a weird one. I was working as a an IT support technician at the time, and I was trying to get a job as a systems administrator. And so I thought I needed to go away and learn some new technologies and, you know, bring myself up to speed with that. And one of those was Docker. So I was like, well, the best way to learn this is I'm just going to have to actually, you know, rent a VPS and try try running some services on it. First one I tried was Mastodon. That went fine. Not a lot of people say that. (laughs) (laughs) And I was using Spotify at the time to listen to music and Spotify removed an album. And I I think it was They Might Be Giants' The Spine. They'd had some sort of licensing dispute or something. And I actually got in touch with John Flansburg of They Might Be Giants and was like, hey, why isn't this on Spotify anymore? And he was just like, I don't know. We don't do the licensing. That's not our job. Um, And so I was like, well... I own a lot of this stuff on CD, so I'd like to have a way to self-host it. And so I was looking for what can I self-host. People were suggesting on Reddit, like Ampachi and all that sort of thing. And then at the bottom of one of these threads, somebody had said, hey, what about Funkwhale? It's AGPL, it's uh, self-hosted, and soon it's going to support ActivityPub. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That other thing I just installed is ActivityPub. Mm. So I tried to install Funkwell. It came with Docker containers, and I was like, fantastic. I tried to install it. I failed mm. <laughs> miserably. Um, so I went into the chat room, started talking to Agat, who was the lead developer at the time. And she basically was like, oh, yeah, the instructions are not good. But she helped me get it installed. I started helping other people and then eventually sort of said, hey, you know, if we just like fix the documentation, we solve a lot of these problems <laughs> do you mind if i have a crack at that and she's like sure so i did and then i also got into fixing front-end bugs teaching myself how that sort of side of things worked and i've been with the project ever since so it's been about five years oh wow mm. so for people who are not familiar with what funk Wheel does is it a kind of google music they're like you could upload your entire music library and stream it yourself for free and there is there an also an, a discoverability element to it like soundcloud maybe um it, from your description those are the, immediately the services that popped into my mind yeah it's a question we get a lot uh, a lot of people seem to come to the fediverse and think this is a set of replacements for the stuff that i have on the clear web or the you know non-federated web uh so they think mastodon mm-hmm. is twitter they think you know pixel fed is instagram <laughs> and they, they do all of that and, and it's perfectly reasonable to assume this but of course then they're looking for the replacement to spotify they see that funkwell does music and they think exactly what you've just said no is the answer we can't be spotify um because the way that spotify works is it's not user generated content it's licensed content we can't do that actually funkwell was originally designed to be a replacement to groove shark uh hence why it's called funk whale it's Groove Shark. That's interesting. Ah. Yeah. Which even even our new maintainer didn't know. <laughs> and I explained <laughs> it to him and he was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is why I didn't find anything when I, when I heard Funk Whale and start looking for a fun quail. No, it's not. A, it's not a fun little bird. No, it, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a funky it's a funky whale. Um, but no, so the, the originally the the sort of uh feature set was based around that you would have a library you could build radios 
you could build playlists. And it kind of just expanded over time. You wanted, you know, I got to added functionality for multiple people to have a server, uh, an account and a server, and then multiple people to have multiple libraries. And then the idea of federation comes in and essentially breaks everything. Because now, you know, you're dealing with privacy levels, you're dealing with all sorts of additional things. So it is mostly for people to... It, upload their own personal catalog and stream it from any device. But there is also functionality called channels, which is for publishing Creative Commons licensed or, you know, licensed art libre or other uh, freely licensed content. And uh, basically people can follow those channels like any other activity pub channel. So they can be followed on, you know, Mastodon or Plarama or whatever it is you use. And this year we are looking to add a lot more discoverability, including the ability to just follow what other users are doing and what they're listening to and what they're liking. This is something where we're having to go back and fundamentally rewrite how some of the activity pub stuff is done because it's uh, a little bit complicated. So it's like uh, Mastodon, Jamendo, and uh, let's say Plex for audio. Yeah, the, the, and, and Jamendo is actually quite a good one uh, to sort of point out because it's about that sort of discoverability of, of freely licensed content. It's not just music, though. Like, podcasting is also sort of natively supported. So we actually were the first project on the Fediverse to support podcasting. Casterpod then came along and focused solely on it, and they have made a lot of strides in that space. So that we're not exactly competing with, with Casterpod. I wouldn't say we, we even look at them as being, you know... <laughs> competitor to us because they're so far ahead on podcasting but um yeah they it's 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 one of the things we do and we do want to do more as well but all one thing at a time we've got to get 1.3.0 out the door first and that's been about a year in the making because that's a complete rewrite of things so yeah i might have missed it when so let's say that i'm i make music in uh, you know some hellish universe when i try and i want to publish it using uh, Funk Whale. Mm -hmm. Do you host it or do I just run my own instance? And uh, yeah, probably that, right? So I would run my own instance of Funk Whale, uh, point it to my files, and that would federate through through the Fediverse. Yeah, uh, ideally we push people to... I say we push people. We, we sort of want people to host their own instance because the Fediverse is stronger the more servers we have in it. And yeah, once you upload some servers, uh, some, some files to a channel, any other user can follow that channel. And if I am on a, on a server and I follow your uh, content, your channel, every other user on my server sees that content and can go and listen to it, follow it, do whatever, because it basically caches all of the information to my server. That's part of the discoverability element of it. Similarly, libraries of content. So prior to having channels, we had these things called libraries. It's a bit messy, but basically that's how you upload your CD collection. And in theory, you can say, you know, I wanted to share mine with you. You can just sort of share a link to a, a collection uh, and, and people can then have that appear on their pod and they just stream it from your, your sort of service. But then you start to, you know, get into the whole realm of, well, how do we handle copyright issues? How do we handle all these different bits and pieces? And that's why we have things like private libraries and we have uh, public libraries and all, all sorts of things, because we're dealing in a very different ballpark to a lot of the other Fediverse projects, which, of course, are all just user generated. You could use the service as just your own private media server um like mm -hmm. i've ripped all of my 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 cds i have 60 gigs worth of cds or something like that and you just have your own hosted server and you went the only thing i'm using this for is to stream down to my mobile device yeah absolutely and in fact you can if that's your only goal you can just turn off federation entirely hmm. yeah okay this is similar, they don't know similar, this has got some similarities to Owncast, which is a project that we've talked about a few episodes back in terms of, well, there are few similarities. Yeah, so I'm going to ask you a similar question to what we asked Gabe back then. How many musicians do you find that are also willing and able to install a Fediverse server? Yeah, not many. Um, <laughs> so we have a few, and uh, I, I can name one off the top of my head uh, as a person called Kyle Bronston actually did quite early on uh, install Funquail and have a service of their own. But the fact of the matter is, when it comes to you know uh, creative types, 
they're not always technical types and a lot of the time they don't want to have to spend all the time faffing around building a server to put their music out there it's it's not enticing and so we do run a flagship instance called open.audio and we do allow people in that and and I, I myself run a, a sort of public instance called Tanuki Tunes, where users get about 10 gigabytes to, to upload content. And we'd like to go further than that. Like, we'd like to make it a one-click thing to run a Funkwell server. Like, that's the ultimate goal for us, but that will take some time. Would you recommend using a Funkwell instance for podcasters as well? You said that you are not ahead with podcasting but would you would you think that for a simple podcast that uh you know a hypothetical podcast that that is that publishes about one episode every two weeks has about four people working on it every time you know all volunteers nothing special do you think that you'd be able to facilitate that there could be three irish people and one american on this I mean, <laughs> nothing specific <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, absolutely. It has all the tools that you need for that. It produces an RSS feed, um, so you get what you need out of it. The publishing flow in design, design wise, was originally conceived with a bunch of podcasters. That's how we did it. Agat approached the community and said, "Look, I want to build the first podcasting solution. What do you need? And what have you got in other services?" It's just that there are, you know, the podcasting has sort of moved on, and there are other things that people might want to do with it. And the actual interface to the software design-wise just isn't as good as it could be. So we have uh, a designer uh, named Mathieu, and he has been banging his head against the wall for about the last two years, drawing wonderful designs to it for us that we've never implemented because we've had other things we needed to do. Um, so we actually have started work on this, um, but it's it's one of those things where we need to get 1.3.0 out the door because that gives us our new uh, sort of uh, what's called the uh, v we use Vue.js as our um, app framework, and we've just shipped the the new major version of that. So then we'll start shipping the new design component library that we've built, which is called uh, you know Funkwell UI. And then we'll start building the new flows, the new tools. And at that point, I would probably suggest, yes, for simple podcasts, Funkwell is pretty good. And you get all, all the stuff you need. For more advanced podcasting stuff, for analytics and those kinds of things, Castapod is going to be better. And this is exactly what Castapod says on their website. You know, they've said exactly the same thing. Funkwell is great for the simple stuff. And if you want to do other audio things, we're the place to be. But if you're purely podcasting, you're going to be best served by Castapod. So I think we should move on to uh, maybe the other project you touched on earlier, uh, the podcasting API. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so we were approached by um, a few of the sort of a few developers of podcatchers. So I think originally it was led by developers of AntennaPod, which is, by the way, a really great podcatcher if anyone's looking for one for Android. Uh, we had Casts, which is a KDE podcatcher, um, a web based podcatcher called Podfriend. And also uh, the developer of the GPodder for Nextcloud plugin. And we were invited in because we make a podcatcher, Funkwell, but it's also a server. So we have some server expertise. The, the, what they wanted to achieve was basically find something or make something to improve upon GPodder. So for people who don't know GPodder, it's a podcatcher for uh, sort of Android and desktop. And it has a service called gpodder.net, which is used to synchronize your playback position uh, and your subscriptions and settings and all these different things about your podcasts, which is great. It's a fantastic idea and that they've been sustaining it for a long time. The problems that we've encountered with it are that it's a centralized service. So basically, you just have gpodder.net and that, I believe, is all that is supported officially. You might be able to run it on your own instance, but I don't think they have instructions for that. And the way that the project is structured has quite a lot of pitfalls. Things like weird behavior if you try and sync a podcast at the same position twice. So you pause a podcast at 351, and then you try and do that again at some other point on a different client or something. Well, the combination of episode and position is globally unique. You can't do that. So it just doesn't sync, which is not great. And they've been working on a new version of the API for a long time, but it's nowhere near ready. So basically the idea was, well, why don't we get together and try and come up with a list of problems to solve and just put together a specification? 
not build a service, not do anything like that, but write a specification that developers could implement as a, you know, as their own server. So if you wanted to uh, build a server in Rust that did all of this stuff, you could do that. If you wanted to build one in Python, if you want to build one in Go, you can do that. All you have to do is implement the specification. So we've basically been having meetings where we discuss what are the problems, what are you trying to achieve, and then try and turn that into a meaningful specification which a developer can build into a client and build into a server. Uh, so far, we are pretty close to uh, publishing the first version of the subscriptions endpoint. And that is quite, is made quite difficult because of trying to align to the podcasting 2.0 side of things, specifically GUIDs. So globally unique identifiers for podcasts. And so we've had to write a whole bunch of behavior in around how GUIDs are handled. And it's, it's just a, it's a really fun project because, you know, we're thinking about things that, you know, I don't think ever even crossed our mind at Funkwell. And I think it's forcing, uh, you know, the client developers to, to sort of grapple with how they want to handle some of the podcasting 2.0 stuff. So that's great. And um, it's been really fun to sort of work on it with them. It's just a lot of writing at the moment. And uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's we're sort of looking for people to come in and tell us what they think. And, you know, do they think that the approach works and that sort of thing. Um, immediately that comes to mind is there there are services that um, their clients are definitely open source so I don't know if their backends are open source but there's Podverse mm -hmm. and Pocket Casts is one that I use and I know they open source their clients recently but probably their, their service is probably proprietary um, but yeah certainly the great thing about open source is all of the code is open and you could like glean lessons off each other or take some of their ideas or maybe they can take, take some of your ideas and I don't mean that in a, in, in a stealing sense that's the benefit of open source is if somebody li has an implementation that you like the look of you can say oh well that kind of saves us work because we don't have to do that then because their Im implementation is better or vice versa. Yeah and I think part of this comes down to the specification will cover a set of core features and in order to be considered um, compliant with the Open Podcast API spec, you have to put these core features in. But it doesn't mean you can't do other things as well. There might be other features you want to add that are specific to your service. And that's fine, as long as your client can then support that on top. So I, I don't know about Podverse, but in theory, they could implement the Open Podcast API as a, a, an additional thing to their service. That would be fine you know, it's it's entirely fine. And if they wanted to join in and say, hey, actually, we have some ideas about this, or we've already done X, Y, and Z, or hey, if Gpodder developers want to come in and say, we tried tackling this, this is where the shortfalls were, you know, then we 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 can talk about that. But um, at the moment, we're, we're sort of tackling it from the perspective of um, where the client developers have found it frustrating. Do you, how does it work? So you are writing up a specification. Do you write like a test implementation in some kind of code as well? We will, yeah. So the idea is that we will write a specification and once we consider a an endpoint or a set of functionality to be ready in from the specification side from the standpoint, then uh, basically Georg, who is the Funkwell uh, sort of project lead, uh, will write a uh, sort of a, a ref reference server to basically see if what we wrote works from the perspective of code. And, you know, hopefully it will. Hopefully it'll be fine. But um, yeah, hope we'll, we'll release this sort of reference server, maybe host it somewhere, but I don't know if that's the plan as yet. And then eventually we will probably put this uh, sort of code into Funkwell directly as well, because then we are even more useful for podcasting as a playback thing. So if I understand it correctly... Once your specification is ready and once either you create the reference server and people start using it and or somebody else comes up with new servers and clients obviously will need to either update or you need to have new clients altogether, you will be able to use... Is it still working along public uh, activity pub? So this is completely separate to activity pub. The, the idea is that it's all based around RSS feeds mm -hmm. because podcasting is... RSS feeds, like this is how podcasting works. What we're saying is that basically, let's say you have a client, say it's AntennaPod, and you subscribe to a new feed on your AntennaPod client. 
And you just want to make it so that when you、uh, go to your cast desktop client, that feed will be present on there. Similar to how it works with, for example, Apple Podcasts. If I subscribe on my iPhone, it turns up on my Mac eventually.、Um, <laughs> it <laughs> takes its time. <laughs> so what this does is very simply: it has a, a REST API where the client、uh, the client can basically send this RSS feed, and it says, "I found this globally unique identifier in the RSS feed." If it finds one, and it sends that information to the server, and the server goes, "Great, I've got that information." Then when you log in with another server, it's、uh, with another client, it says. To the server, hey, tell me everything that's changed since I last checked in with you. And the server says, well, since I la- you last checked in, this feed was added. So you should probably f- download that feed and get those podcast co- episodes in here. And the great thing about that is that it can work across、uh, clients. Exactly. So you can have one. You don't have to be stuck with a single company's podcast client for desktop, auto, and uh, uh, mobile phone,、mm-hmm. but you can have antenna pod on one, for example. Yeah. And also, if, for example, you were using someone else's server to synchronize everything, and then you decided, you know what, I want to run my own, and you ran your own server, all you would then have to do is log into that server with your client, and it would send all of the information it has, which should be up to date with the server that you just came from, and basically you've migrated everything you have to the new server because the client ultimately holds. You know that the server is a reference point of truth for all all of the clients. The clients hold the data as is true at that time, so they can be used to pick up and move data if you need to. I just had a great、uh, use case for this. I'm sure it exists, but imagine that you are outside on your phone listening to your podcast. You walk home, something somewhere outside of the system registers that you are home. It will switch off your、uh, headphones and turn off for every room that you walk through. It will turn the podcast on exactly at time of entry into the speakers in the room. So you basically just seamlessly waltz through life, always listening to what you want to listen to, no matter where you are. I, I mean, <laughs> that's sci-fi, and I like yeah, it. I, I like it a lot.、Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so、um, Sonos integration is coming soon.、Uh, <laughs> But、um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I imagine, and you you hinted at it earlier, is that your position in the episode、uh, will be syn- synchronized up, and、um, chapters and everything like that will be. Yes, you said this is a simple Rust、uh, Rust REST API, yeah. Yeah. Actually, what Connor said,、uh, you know, you, I know you were joking when you said、uh, Sonos integration, but that means that unless they scrap that whole thing before. You can actually do things like Alexa Skill or whatever other,、uh, you know, whatever other cylindrical devices people might have at home, because it will just,、uh, it will be simple application. Everything understands REST and HTTP,、mm-hmm. or, or as、um, Alan Pope calls them, lady cylinders. <laughs> <laughs> The other one I've heard is lady yeah. tubes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> lady tubes. <laughs> Yeah, it, it the, the whole point was try to create because G Podder is is a great service. Like you know, this is not us saying G Podder sucks. We want to replace it. Blah blah blah. G Podder just has a lot of、uh, of technical debt to overcome, and it was it's going to take them a, a long time to get there. And you know, we think that starting fresh with an、uh, a, you know a very simple REST API is probably the best way forward. And that's exactly what we've tried to do. We've tried to split everything into its component parts and do this all from the perspective of what do we expect at Funkwell as server developers versus what do AntennaPod expect as client developers and Cast expect as client developers,、um, you know, and and what does like Nextcloud expect from the perspective of a plugin? All of these things we're trying to consider and basically build something that does exactly that. It just replicates that functionality. Of a service that people are used to, like you know Spotify, like Apple Podcasts, when it comes to that seamless integration between devices, eventually with Apple because、uh, it takes time.、Um, it, you know, it, it it puts all of these things together, but it, it takes away that element of proprietoryness and it takes away that element of being locked to a server. You are not locked to a server. You're not locked to a client. As long as you've got a client that has the most up to date information, you can migrate to another server. By just putting in the details, and it sends all of the information it has as a series of calls. These are my subscriptions. These are my episode positions. These are my whatever it may be. That is very compelling. I, I must say that is very compelling.、Uh, one thing that has tied me to Pocket Cast in the past is ju- simply 
their seamless um, synchronization between different devices and also um, they have a, a web UI. Full disclosure, I'm grandfathered into their lifetime subscription. Other, I think it's it's a it's a yearly subscription to avail of this service now, which is is not exactly that expensive either. But I, I the very fact of like I'm getting all of this for free, <laughs> it is very compelling for me as well. <laughs> so it's just um the ease of use, and if something is as easy to use and is as easily integrated as I find Pocket Casts, then yeah. And also the open nature of it, the the fact that if I don't like a server, I can just get up and take my podcast subscriptions with me, um, all with their the synchronized. He's halfway through this episode. He has ten minutes left in that episode. All of that information is also synchronized across. There. Yeah, that's very compelling. Yeah, and that that's all down to the that that's all down to the to the um, client developers because the client developers you know obviously they'll cache all that information they have that information on the device so they're just going to if you if you say log out of this server log into this server it's basically just going to send a status dump and say this is where it all is not that we have actually written that part of the spec yet but that is the expected <laughs> behavior it's it's on the roadmap it's on the roadmap yeah 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 check back with us in a, in a little while do you have like a at this date we would like to be at X and at this date is going to be finished and published? So tell me, your, is it going to be QT, Q2 or Q3? Or <laughs> <it's gonna laughs> Look, you're talking to the person who's sitting on a year old release of Funkwell, okay? Um, no, there is no timeline. We're all, you know, we all are involved in different projects. Um, so, you know, we dedicate what time we have. We, we have a monthly meeting about this to kind of discuss what, what needs to be done, what's next. Like I say, we started work on this, uh, and we met up about this at FOSDEM, which is when it really kicked off. So that was in February. And um, basically, we have the subscriptions endpoint, which is uh, synchronizing subscriptions, deleting subscriptions, um, you know, posting new subscriptions, modifying subscriptions. Those things are specced. There's a few corrections we need to write. And that's, you know, that, that just that functionality has taken us a while. The, the most important thing for us to do is establish what core functionality is. Like, what do we consider to be the absolute core functionality that we can't do without? So that's things like episode syncs, you know, it's things like playback position syncs. It's things like settings synchronization might, you know, so if you say, I want this podcast specifically to be played at two, two times speed on every podcast client that supports that that kind of thing that's stuff that gpodder has and that we would like to kind of replicate but the idea is that the spec is kind of living so we can say this is a course this is a core endpoint this is core functionality and as of this version you need to have this in order to be spec compliant but then other things we might say are optional we might still spec them because we want to give an idea of how it might work but we won't say that they're core functions you know we need to decide what the core functionality looks like and then that will give us an idea of like what the lift is like, what the effort is like to to put that all down into words. At the moment, it's just me writing, um, which it puts a, you know, a limit on it because, um, you know, I'm also doing all the writing at Funkwell and specking there. And then I'm also, I have a day job apparently, which is rude. Um, <laughs> and they expect me to, to write and, and build stuff. And, you know, frankly, how, how dare they? <laughs> I mean, you, you you have to put food on your table somehow, and you have to uh, go clubbing in Berlin somehow. Yeah, yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's a hard lifestyle here, I tell you. You know. <laughs> so uh, I I'm curious. Um, there's seems to be a through line between those projects that you're involved in. So you have uh, podcasting, which is audio based, and Funk Whale, which is broadly music based. Uh, do you, is that kind of a an interest of yours? Are, are you into? Are you a music head? Um, are you an audio head? Oh well, as we can tell from how I set ev- how I failed to set everything up here, uh, audio technology is clearly not my strength. <laughs> but <laughs> I am a musician. I was I was raised p- playing musical instruments, so I was uh, I played violin since I was about five or six. My mum's in the next room; she'll be able to tell me. She'll probably come in and go, "No, you haven't." <laughs> um, but but uh, I played piano. I, I played like piano accordion was one of my big instruments. Guitar, bass. I was in bands as a kid. I've always loved music, uh, and from both of my parents, I have uh, sort of a, a big CD collection, a big collection of music that I just love to listen to. So it's definitely, you know, a through line in, of passion for me. Podcasts, much later though, like I did not catch the podcast train when it first came about, sort of in the early 2000s. 
Uh, it's been it was much later that I actually started to get into podcasts and start to really appreciate them as a as an art form and as a method of of um, you know getting information and stuff like that. But now I just listen to them all the time. So for me, it's like you know that's something I consider to be a a core thing that we need to get right, especially in the Fediverse, because as people are moving to the Fediverse as kind of their distributed platform for doing everything, which it does seem to be a lot of people are doing, we need to get that bit right. And so, you know, we'll continue to produce our podcast uh, related tech because we, uh, you know, like I say, we respect what Castapod is doing and they are a long way ahead of us in terms of their functionality. But we don't want, necessarily want something that supports podcasting 2.0 to be the only option. We don't particularly like podcasting 2.0. Not all of it, some bits of it are great, but specifically the the, the funding mechanisms and things like that are just kind of anathema to us. So l- less with the Satoshis is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, what well, we would prefer to, um, we've been looking into stuff like we have our own project, which is called Retribute, uh, which is a Funkwell project that basically lets you find uh, people you interact with in the Fediverse and uh, see what their donation links are. So, you know, if I've been interacting with you a lot, Connor, for example, it will say, well, hey, you interacted with Connor like 20 times this month why not give them some money they've got some they've got a patreon in their in their uh, bio so i just plug my my mastodon handle in and it says here's all the people you've interacted with weighted by how many they've done so we have that and then there's also a new payments api that they're trying to put in as a w3c standard and that's more what we would like to to sort of focus on when it comes to monetizing content than crypto which we're just we're just not comfortable with did you know, uh, so you, apologies if you said this already, but uh, you say you are working on specs in regards to the uh, GUID in that podcasting 2.0 mm-hmm. brought, brought in. Is it going to work without it? Yes. Because that's quite a, okay, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, so it, that is one of the things we, we sort of came across. So it, it, the way that the spec sort of puts it is that uh, the client can read the RSS feed and look for a GUID. And if it's a podcast 2.0 um, RSS feed, or if it has been you know, put into a service that supports podcasting 2.0, the feed will have a GUID. So the client can send that to the server and say, this is the GUID, this is the feed, that's it. But if you get a feed that doesn't have a GUID, all that will happen is you'll send the feed alone, no GUID, to the server. The server then generates a GUID and sends it back and says, when you query the, the API, here's the GUID you need to query. So it always has a GUID, and then if at a later date, for example, they add a GUID into the feed, the client can then say, hey, update this and put this new GUID in, and the server says, right, this entry now has a new GUID, and it returns it and says to any client that asks, so another client comes in later and says, has something changed? It goes, yes, something has changed. That now has a new GUID, and you need to use that instead. Okay, that sounds really good. That, uh, yeah, makes complete sense. Yeah. Like, like, I, and uh, you know, th- again, respect to Castapod here. They, they were, we, we talked with them at, at Fosdem, and they were talking about how they've been very careful about making uh, podcasting 2.0 and podcasting 1.0 compatible things, and making sure that they don't overlap uh, or, or overwrite each other, basically. And that's exactly what we're trying to do as well. Like, absolutely, podcasting 1.0 is still going to be around for a while, so we need to support it. It might never go away. Some people just may not want to use it. That's fine. So, Kieran, uh, just to change tack for a little bit, um, I was uh, I was just scanning through uh, our interactions in our Telegram chat and on Mastodon, and I see we both have very similar opinions on Star Trek Picard. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that was a nice little touchstone. But um, yeah, first season, I got as far as episode four. I tr- tried to watch it twice, both times. I I think first time I got to episode two second time i got to episode four and i just i just i just couldn't hear the show because i was just groaning so loud mm. the entire time like no that's not how that would be no come on it's it's a uh, it's a master class in character assassination it really is um, <laughs> they, they I, 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 th- I think i lasted about half of a season through and i think that in the first episode i, I was uh, to me it it seems to be very forced i was like ha ha i called my dog number one I was like, oh. there's a hearty amount of cringe, but then there's also just a fundamental misunderstanding of the character and the world. And exactly. That stuff is sad to me because you know, I the thing is, I don't mind. It, they make Star Trek and they make a new series of Star Trek, and it's 
you know, goofy, like this, like, Lower Decks thing is. That's kind of okay to me. I just won't watch it. That's fine. But, like, it's totally separate. That's absolutely fine by me. I, 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 I liked Discovery. Sure. And, and, and Discovery is a totally separate thing. I mean, it has, yeah, yeah. it has, uh, it does go into original series, but I'll be honest and say I don't really like original series that much. You know, I'm very much that sort of period from TNG to halfway through Voyager and a little bit of Enterprise. That was kind of it for me. DS9 and, 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 uh, and TNG were my thing. Yeah. But like, that, where I have problems is that Picard is an, a well established character. He's, got a history he's got he, you know he was written fully and they've gone in and just completely misunderstood the character and i don't know if it, that's not necessarily just what's his name kurtzman or is it Ortsy? one of those two who leads it all um mm. it's not just him it's also it's also um you know patrick stewart's wanting to play the hero and do that side of things it's just not right that was uh a key difference. Uh, Patrick Stewart was actually involved in the writing for the show, whereas he wasn't uh, in previous Star Trek. Um, and I was yeah. like, S- stick to playing the character. That <laughs> sticks to like, letting someone else write the lines. He's never understood the character, to be honest. I don't think he's ever really understood the show. And that's fine. As I understand, though, uh, people have been telling me, no, watch season three, because it's basically just like the next generation new clothes. Um, uh, it's like, and my friend said, said this to me, everyone is back. And he's like, no, no everyone is back <laughs> yeah every I, character you remember <laughs> makes I mean, an appearance I, I watch a lot of red letter media and uh you know oh i, per, oh, I, I love that i was gonna yeah. say i was very pleased that like my opinions seemed to align when i first watched it i then watched the red letter media sort of trying to watch it um mm-hmm. and and watching mike and rich kind of collapse i was just like oh thank god it's not just me um <laughs> but but then like they even they've been quite you know They've been putting on some praise on season three, um, but for me, it doesn't matter. It, it's it, they kind of burn that bridge. They it doesn't matter if season three is great. I'm not going to watch it because I don't want to put any money in their pocket and I don't want them to make any more. I, I think I will skip straight to season three and watch like a, a recap video of the first two seasons. Um, yeah, just because for nostalgia purposes, because apparently season three is chock full of nostalgia. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard it's like a, a like a movie, like the first four episodes or so that what they were saying on red letter media was it's kind of like a tng movie but a good one um and i'm just like i didn't realize that could be a thing um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um you know so i i can i can i can dig it I, like i say it's just for me personally I'm, I'm i'm done star trek to me it lasted in it was in the like late 80s to the to the early 2000s and i don't really engage with it beyond that um i was yeah. just angry at picard because i like that character and mm. i hate what they did to him yeah, I've kind of recently moved on to uh, The Expanse. That's kind of my favorite sci-fi fandom in the last few years. Mm. Um, for me, I never really had that thing where I was wa- watching The Next Generation as it was coming out. Um, so for me, um, I was like, uh, uh, like canon, whatever. It, it's not that important to me because I was never emotionally invested in the first place. So that's, yeah. and you said you, that's the reason why I'm enjoying watching this Discovery. I'm like, it's his own thing, and I'm actually really enjoying it and everything. And it's like, it's like J.J. Abrams' space drag lasers and battles and everything. It's like, <laughs> hey, it, it's entertaining. Yeah. Still. yeah, I watched TNG through reruns on Sky One. <laughs> Yeah. For, for for me, the one that came out the the episode the sci fi show that I watched religiously growing up was uh, Stargate SG One. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. I love how self referential it got towards the end. It was actually quite cool. I I, I was ra- I mean, I was too young to watch Star Trek growing up because I was born in like nineteen ninety four. So by the time I was watching Star Trek, it was already the sort of mid 2000s and so but but like it was always voyager on rerun and my dad and i would watch voyager and my, you know i then saw a few episodes of tng but i really didn't get into star trek until like university and i binge watched a lot of it didn't really like original series it's a bit too corny i yeah. i don't know what it is about the treatment of of women in that show is very weird yeah. And that carries, I mean, it's, you know, obviously a lot of it is just straight up offensive, but then even the bits where they're trying to be progressive, it's, it just comes off as really 
weird like they've never interacted with a human woman before um <laughs> and, then you, and then you get season one of, of next generation and it's exactly the same thing and i was like oh no but they didn't learn their lesson at all but then you know season one finishes and you're just like oh okay they got a new writing staff and it became fine but for me it was always like i don't like the jj abrams like uh starship lays as much uh, much i mean i liked the first star trek and i quite liked the third one the second one no no but for me i just like the almost submarine nature of, of like tng where it's like cold war era submarines meeting and basically you could start a nuclear war at any point if you're not careful with how you resolve this issue diplomatically and it takes them 45 minutes to have that conversation and they're <laughs> constantly checking with each other am i doing this right is this right I love that stuff. Like that, that to yeah. me is is the pinnacle of, of Star Trek. That's what I always said. To me, the next generation was uh, like I don't really care much about sci-fi because I don't, I don't know. But I really enjoyed the kind of confluence of yeah, we are getting from this away from this uh, nonsense that we lived in for forty years, and at the same time, we are getting all this American culture, and it's showing us that yeah. the world is going to be great. And we are going to get to a place where being human really means something cool. And as I was growing up, that was a really cool message. And uh, I don't think uh, Amazon Studios or whoever does it now can... I don't think they can reproduce this. You know, I forget about characters and, and lasers and whatever. I don't think they can c- bring back this mood that, uh, you know, the sentiment I, that I still get from watching TNG and um, Deep Space Nine. No. Not from Voyager, though. I didn't finish Voyager ever, and I don't know why. I watched the entire thing. I loved it. And don't for, don't forget the Irish reunification in 2024. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that it was interesting. That was actually cut out from the episode for the longest yeah. time, and the uh, the episode was banned in the UK for a time because of that. Hey, look, the UK is pushing pushing us all towards it. You can thank us. Um, <laughs> we've been doing that. They, they, they said something like uh, Brexit did more for our reunification in uh, than Sinn Fein have done in thirty years. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely, and and Scottish uh, Scottish independence, and even Welsh independence. You know what? Cornwall can go independent too. Why not? It, it, it's just, just for you know, form a Gaelic form a Gaelic union. Okay, Ireland, oh, oh, the, the Wales, Isle of Man is in there too. Sure, Ireland, Wales, Scotland, Isle of Man, Cornwall. You guys all have great fun. Just leave leave England as this sad little nation. Um, you know, we just, hey, look, we've got a king. We'll be fine, okay? He just got crowned. It's great. Um, <laughs> but no, I think with, with, with like TNG and all that stuff, you've you got to remember like 1989, that was like the fall of the Berlin, Berlin Wall. There was this hope. There was so much hope in the world. You know, people were like, oh my gosh, all of this stuff that was going on is coming to, coming, coming to an end. We can be friends with our enemies. We can work together to a better world. Uh, that we're working like the new series, Discovery, Picard, all of that lot. They're working in a fundamentally different world where after especially after 2016 all of the hope started to just like drain it was i mean obviously post 9 11 is where it really started but 2016 was like a moment where somebody just pulled the plug and the hope just went yeah. from circling down so we entered the dark timeline we did and i and i think that's what the writers have to contend yeah. with but I just I live that. I don't want to watch it on TV. I don't want to watch. I don't want to watch my favorite Happy Time Captain going through that because I'm going through that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they they need to give us. This is the in my opinion. This is one of the core competencies of art. They can give yeah. us hope in shitty times, right? Especially you know. I, I there are others, but like. They could create first something new. For fuck's sake, Hollywood, everybody, just create new things. Stop, send, stop rehashing what you've done before. It's not suitable. It's not funny, and it's not watchable anymore. And like, put, figure out what people need, and just produce it. You know, especially these days, they have so much money. They could just, uh, and they, you know, the, the scene, the 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 scene in uh, TNG where they literally had to all move to the right and then to the left to pretend that mm-hmm. the enterprise is shaking or whatnot it was. I don't remember. That can now be done credibly and for no money. You know, they have so much stuff they can work with now. So they just should take it up and produce something that people would actually love, you know. And it doesn't have to be happy, clappy, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Firefly was amazing. Again, product of its times. And that it still can happen. It's just somebody needs to actually do it. Yeah. I remember watching Firefly for the first time, and again, I missed it when it first came out. And I was watching it, and I was like, this is Cowboy Bebop. 
We've had yeah. this. Yeah. It's it's the same thing. I mean, it's it's a different coat of paint. It's a different tone for sure. Mm-hmm. It's it's you know whatever. But I was just there like okay, it's it's space cowboys mm. and it's like in a world where everyone speaks Chinese and English and and all these. We I've seen this before. <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong. I love them both. I've never actually seen uh, any of Star Trek except for the recent movies. Oh, you're in for a treat then. I yeah, highly I think recommend you would going enjoy back it. and watching Next Generation. And I, I think, to me, DS9 is, is the best. Mm-hmm. But TNG is the most hopeful and positive. Just, you've got to get through season one <laughs> and two. Because they've got some bright spots, but... Oh, Boy, do they have some <laughs> black holes. Um. <laughs> My girlfriend and I will give it a watch. Uh, and DS9 is uh, DS9 is a little bit boring at the start. Uh, it has some good episodes, but you. honestly, um, yeah, I found like I almost got to season five before I was like, when is this show going to get going? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I I never got into it. It was it was a whole bunch of frangies. I I just didn't understand. <sighs> Yeah, but 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 Cisco, he was great. come like, on, yeah. isn't he just mm. almost? I know this is a uh, this is a blasphemy, but isn't he? Isn't he really a much better cap? Not much, but just a little bit. Isn't he really a tiny wee bit? Sometimes maybe better than Picard as a character. It's a, I don't it's think so. It's just a very different. Is he's just very different. Like Picard is very rigid by the rules and whatever. And Cisco starts out DS Nine hating. Starfleet because of what happened to his wife you know and and that's a really interesting perspective to start from like Mm. we have to follow a a commander who becomes a captain uh who hates this system but is being put into this situation with his enemies all around him you've got the Cardassians who are basically handing over Terek Nord to him and it's like you've got this faction of aliens who are you know technically own this place but you know they have they need help with the stewardship it's very it's got a lot of tensions, which TNG never had. And mm. that's interesting. And you might like it, you might not. Uh, some people just prefer TNG, and that's absolutely great. Yeah. I, 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 I preferred Voyager. I like them both. Yeah. I, I, I have a soft spot for Voyager, but Neelix does get a bit much sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're going to gloss, gloss, up the, uh, gloss over the episode where they become uh, future lizards and mate. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. we're going to gloss over the episode where Janeway and Chakotay get abandoned on a planet because they get like infected by something and they very almost uh, do the sort of vertical shuffle together. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, oh, I, yeah. I, oh. Oh, or when yeah. Janeway falls in love with an Irish hologram. Uh, oh, remember yeah. that one? Hey, it happens. Okay. Fair Haven. <laughs> it's a very sexy accent. They're, they're in a they're in a little uh, they're in a little Irish village in the in the hollow deck, and it's all it's it's exactly what you think it is. It's like tee 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 tee, you know, Darby O'Gill and the little people. Like, <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean the 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 um the episode of TNG where they basically is it TNG yes yeah, TNG where they have the let's face it Irish settlers yeah uh, that they just bring on board and it's 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 the most like stereotypical racist they still nonsense. still dress like they are in the eighteen hundreds and everything <laughs> yeah <laughs> I haven't shown my girlfriend that because she's she's from 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 Kerry and I think she would probably be like what what <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. To his to to his credit, um, um, I forget his name. To um, the actor, oh, Colin Meany. Colin when Meany. He be- yeah, when he be- became Chief O'Brien, um, he was reading the character and says, "An American of like Boston Irish descent." And he says he went into it and says, "Will I do an attempt at a Boston Irish accent?" And they went, "No, just straight, just do your own accent." And it, it worked because then it was genuine. It was there was no pretense about it. Okay, I think that about wraps things up. Um, so as what we usually do when we have a guest on Kieran is we allow them to uh, give out any links or socials or anything um, that they'd like to put out there. Uh, so you can follow Funkwell uh, on Mastodon or on the Fediverse uh, through a platform of your choosing. So we are Funkwell at Fosterdon.org. Our website is Funkwell.audio. You can reach me also on the Fediverse. Uh, that's CDA at Fosterdon.org. And if you're interested in the Open Podcast API, uh, the website is openpodcastapi.org. So that's all one word, Open Podcast API. There's nothing there yet, but when we publish the first set of specs, it should appear and you should be amazed. Sounds great.
Does Open uh, Open Podcast API have a GitHub that you would want people to contribute to? Or yeah, absolutely. It's um, so it's GitHub uh, GitHub dot com uh, slash Open Podcast API, all one word, and then the repository is API hyphen specs. So if you want to go in and have a look, there is a pull request open um, for the subscriptions endpoint, and that's where we're doing the work on that. Amazing. Okay. So thanks so much for coming on. It was uh, it was actually very uh, a very uh, nice discussion. Um, pretty interesting. So I'd encourage everyone to check out those two projects. I do want to mention before we finish wrapping things up that I'm going to be at Southeast Linux Fest in about a month. So if anyone wants to meet up, write the show, write me, whatever links will be in the show notes. So yeah, get in touch uh, and get a picture with your very own Linux lad uh, at Southeast Linux Fest. <laughs> you can get a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> ha 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 ha. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I could not resist. So if you want to support the show, uh, we have a store. You can go to linuxlads.com forward slash store. Uh, to buy a mug or a t-shirt, something like that. Uh, we have a Steam community where you can find out when we're gaming and that kind of thing. So go to steamcommunity.com slash groups slash Linux Lads. You can get on our Telegram group, uh, which is linuxlads.com slash Telegram. You can go to uh, get us on Matrix as well, linuxlads.com slash Matrix. That's actually bridged to the Telegram as well. Uh, we are on Twitter. Uh, so linuxlads.com slash Twitter. I believe it's just at linuxlads. And then linuxlads.com slash Mastodon will get you to the Mastodon page as well. Um, you can also email us on show at linuxlads.com. And uh, despite rumors to the contrary, we do exist in real life. Uh, you can meet us in for reals lands at uh, dublinlinux.org. Uh, you can go to one of our meetups if you live in the Dublin area. Uh, so we have those pretty frequently. Okay. So yeah, thanks very much for coming along, Kieran, and thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we'll be back in about two weeks. So see you later. Bye. Adios. Bye. Bye. Fifty percent Linux. Fifty percent lads. <laughs>